Welcome back to Row and Roper, the podcast brought to you by AmericanEagle.com Studios. We're going to look at the right stuff, Richard Roper, which is a limited series right now on Disney Plus on the National Geographic banner of Disney Plus. It's a telling more faithful to the 1979 book by Tom Wolfe and a little bit like the movie, but not completely. That's exactly right. Uh, the Tom Wolfe book, which was a sensation when it came out in 1979, was turned into a film by Philip Kaufman. We're going to do a deep dive into that as well, Ro. And now this series, this eight-part series from Disney Plus and Nat Geo, obviously when you have eight hours, although the right stuff was more than three hours. So right. It would be three episodes. Very long. But now they got eight hours, so we get into even more of the personal lives of the astronauts. And, Ro, I want to eventually expand this and talk about some of the other great space travel astronaut themed movies of all time and why they're always so popular i got a list for you later on of all the academy award-winning actors who have played space travelers just in the last decade alone when the right stuff came out it was a huge budget film made almost in concert with the release of the book i mean it it was four years after the release of the book but clearly it had taken them years and years and years to put that particular production together because that movie had everything Every special effect you could possibly imagine for the time. It had practical effects. They had to bring you through decades of development of the space program, starting in the late 1940s is when the movie The Right Stuff starts at Edwards Air Force Base, the breaking of the sound barrier by Chuck Yeager. Now, that is not a part of the Disney Plus thing at all. It's a big part of the book, the original book, but they really pick it up with the announcement of the Mercury 7, and they actually use the real audio of the announcement with their score underneath. These ladies and gentlemen are the nation's Mercury astronauts. Contrast that to how the movie The Right Stuff handled this, and you get a little sense of the difference between watching the Disney Plus series and that big 80s Right Stuff movie. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Seven Americans, gentlemen all, Americans, Mercury, Astronaut. Why don't we go back and talk a little bit about the book itself, Ro. Tom Wolfe, for people who don't know, one of the great writers of the latter part of the 20th century. And The Right Stuff was one of the great books of new journalism that was practiced by Tom Wolfe. Truman Capote with In Cold Blood, mm. Gay Talese, who wrote about the, the New York mob. And these were big, sprawling, epic books that were nonfiction, but took more poetic license, shall we say, than the, the nonfiction of the past. So it was made for a big, giant movie. So Philip Kaufman, the director, did an amazing job. The James Horner score, which, you know, the classic astronaut movie score. You know that you're going to be, you know, almost saluting and feeling patriotic and and being moved by that music and what's going to happen. And I'd like to talk a little bit about the casting too, Ro, because when you see it now, you go, oh, wow, look, there's um, there's Scott Glenn, there's Ed Harris, a lot of uh, well-known actors, but they weren't Fred Ward as Gus Grissom, but they weren't really all that well-known when the movie was cast in the early 80s. And it was a very specific thing that was happening around the time that movie was being made. And this really is a very important point for the differential between people who are going to be watching the right stuff on Disney Mm Plus and expecting to see stuff that was like the movie. It's told from a totally different perspective. When the right stuff was made as a film in 1983, it was a glorious look at the Mercury program and these heroes. But the movie does something completely different from what this TV show is doing. John Glenn was portrayed in the movie as this gigantic hero, and in part because he was running for president in 1984, and it was speculated that the producers were trying to give him a little bit of a boost, and maybe that would be a good promotion for the movie itself if the hero of the movie actually ran and became president of the United States. Mm Mm-hmm. But he was seen as this ascendant political star at the time. And I believe what a lot of people at the time were saying, that the movie script got doctored a little bit so it would help him with his political career. Well, and there's no disputing the fact that he was a great pilot and a great American hero. But I do find it interesting that the Disney Plus series gives us a different kind of look at John Glenn. They do highlight the fact that he is the leader, but he's also the guy who's working the public relations machine, both sides of it. He's trying to trying to like be the leader, 
of the other astronauts, but he's meeting with that with the PR people, with the ad campaign people, with Life Magazine, who have famously had that contract where they paid the astronauts' families a lot of money to have the exclusive access. And the astronauts, the other guys, most prominently Alan Shepard, are like, listen, I respect you, but I ain't acting like I'm your buddy because you go behind my back. I don't buy your goody-goody act. There's a lot of Mad Men-esque scenes in the limited series, bro. And in fact, Aaron Stanton, who was in Mad Men, plays Wally Shira. And there's a lot of scenes in the series where six of the guys want to go get a drink, maybe go in the pool, maybe meet a couple of the local gals <laughs> who are just fans of science. And John Glenn is holier than thou. There's nothing wrong with that, but is not seen as one of the group. The other thing I want to go back and talk about, Ro, you, you touched on Chuck Yeager, the real-life hero pilot who uh, is featured prominently in the book as the hero, really, of the book or the, you know, the leading man, and then in the movie itself. It is not a part of the streaming series. In the movie, we see very early on, he's an American cowboy, Sam Shepard, who is perfectly cast, literally rides up on a horse, and he's like he's the, <laughs> he's the first one before this group of young hotshots. And the casting of Sam Shepard, that guy, you know, was, first of all, he had won the Pulitzer Prize for his playwriting. He was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor, actually for the right stuff. And he was with Jessica Lange at the time. Yeah. So he was a man of great talent and uh, really an all-American uh, type, but almost an anti-hero type, perfectly cast, I think, is Chuck Yeager. One of the more interesting twists in the Tom Wolfe book is how unfair the process was of choosing the astronauts. They weren't just looking for the best pilots. They were looking for guys who would be the front, the face of NASA. They needed these guys to be good-looking, to be telegenic before anybody really used that word. As a matter of fact, the Marines were sending out John Glenn to be on talk shows and game shows to sell the story of marine aviation. And the unfortunate reality was that Chuck Yeager wasn't really a telegenic guy. He really wasn't going to be the face of the space program, and most importantly, he didn't have a college degree, which was demanded by the program. And all this, despite the fact he was a World War II ace, he shot down Nazi jet fighter aircraft with his P-51 propeller plane. It's one of the great stories of World War II aviation, but he wasn't chosen to be an astronaut because he just didn't fit the bill. You need some more speed records in this day and age. You need coverage. Coverage? Oh, you mean them little root weevils that crawl around popping off cameras in your face? Those root weevils write history. Yeah, well, let them write the damn history and let the pilots fly the airplanes. The limited series, I think, is it makes some interesting choices here because they treat John Glenn differently, as we're talking about. They also treat the Gordon Cooper character who, you know, back in the movie, people will recall, is played by Dennis Quaid. He was yeah, like a hot dog. He mm -hmm. was a gonzo guy, hot shot pilot. They don't play him like that in this limited series. No, we did get some drama with the uh, domestic lives, the family lives of the astronauts in the, in the movie. As a lot of people know, John Glenn's wife stuttered, and back then... Even today, unfortunately, there's somewhat of a stigma. But back then, he was really intent on protecting her while NASA wanted to get her out in front of the TV cameras and talk to the radio broadcasters, et cetera. But in the series, we not only get that angle, but we get a lot of, there's a lot of domestic strife. There's at least right. two marriages that are going maybe sideways. Uh, there's a whole domestic drama involving a, a new child that, you know, is brought into another family. I think part of that, row might be because... There's a limited budget at work here, too, for the streaming series, even though some of it looks really great. But there are a lot of scenes that take place just in the interiors of homes. You don't get a whole lot of aviation. It seems like they blew their budget in the opening scene of the first episode. But yeah. it's it's well done. Well, I the, mean, but the production design is first rate, you know, capturing the cars and the interiors and the fashions, as I mentioned, you know, that kind of Mad Men era. It does a great job of that. It's interesting you're talking about the PR stuff too, Ro, because, you know, when we look back on this glory age of – of space travel starting in the in the 50s and the space race with Russia, which we were losing for a long time, and then landing on the moon. It, it all took place within about a decade. And then there were, you know, obviously other things that happened, and there's a, a Netflix documentary out right now about the Challenger, brilliantly done and sometimes tough-to-watch documentary series. But what people might forget is that the space program, NASA was always kind of had hat in hand, right? Because there were a lot of people who said, why are we spending all this money 
on showboating and beating the Russians and going to the moon when we have all these problems at home. And, you know, the Vietnam War is raging and there's racial unrest and there's poverty and there's all these other problems right in front of us. So there are a lot of times where it's like, well, we don't know if we're going to be able to continue because we need the money. That's an excellent point because the book and the movie really emphasize that. Beautiful. You know what really makes your rocket ships go up? Hell, the aerodynamics alone it takes so long to explain to you that funding, that's what makes your ships go up. I'll tell you something, and you guys too. No bucks, no Buck Rogers. Oh, and you definitely get a sense of that from the limited series as well. One of the great stories in American overspending is the fact that NASA has two headquarters. They've got a headquarters in Florida, Cape Canaveral, and then they've got the Space Center in Houston. Why do you need two headquarters? Why? Because Lyndon Johnson, before he was even Vice President Lyndon Johnson, lobbied for it when he was a senator from Texas. And then as Vice President, he made sure Texas always got the lion's share of the space money. Okay, I know we got a break row, but when we come back, I have for you, my friend... Two different lists that I think you're going to find interesting that you know nothing about that I'm keeping <laughs> hidden from you, but I think it'd be pretty fascinating and speak to Hollywood's fascination with the space program and what we just talked about in terms of the budget. We're back in 60 seconds. I'm Bob Burke, founder and chairman of Burke America Parts Group, a family of brands that includes RepairClinic.com, an appliance and HVAC parts solution company that's grown into an international brand. Before AmericanEagle.com, we partially launched a new technology platform developed by another firm. American Eagle helped take our technology to a whole new level with digital marketing, software development, and business insights into our key markets, appliances, HVAC, and outdoor power equipment, and did so both on time and on budget. AmericanEagle.com has the resources, experience, and talent needed to produce solutions. Our new technology platform developed by AmericanEagle.com has produced tremendous results with higher traffic, conversion, engagement, and online revenue. If you have any home repairs you need to take care of, check us out at RepairClinic.com. If you need a world-class website or technology project, then I would highly recommend AmericanEagle.com. Call AmericanEagle.com at 773-NETWORK. That's AmericanEagle.com, 773-NETWORK. This is Roan Roper, the podcast. I'm Rokan. He's Richard Roper, brought to you by AmericanEagle.com Studios. Talking about The Right Stuff, which is now a limited series on Disney+, Plus, but of course based on the book by Tom Wolfe from 1979 and the movie from 1983. One of the interesting things about the limited series, as you mentioned before, is that it's a lot of actors we may have seen in a few things, but they're not particularly well-known as the actors from the movie The Right Stuff weren't particularly well-known back in 1983. One of the issues I've had with this series is trying to keep up with who's who in the first couple of episodes. It is a little bit confusing, I think, in particular, the Alan Shepard and uh, Gordon Gordon Cooper Cooper characters, uh, because they have kind of similar storylines and kind of similarly handsome guys playing them. And there are some moments where it gets a little confusing. The wives uh, have bigger roles here, too, and and remind us of the fact that when you took off your clothes in 1961, you still looked like you were wearing clothes because the underwear was gigantic. <laughs> a couple of middle-aged white guys shouldn't be having this conversation in the year 2020, but still, it is interesting. I think women will watch this and be sort of amazed by the fashions including the underwear fashions of the time. Yeah, pretty complicated stuff. We were talking about how both the streaming series and the movie get into the fact that you know NASA was always looking to get money from Congress, right? I mean, that was an ongoing thing, obviously, an ex- hugely expensive program. And I had our fine friends at NASA help me out with this row. You always hear about these lists, like all the technology that came about because of the space program. And it's not necessarily something that was used, although some of it was used really, you know, unmanned missions but maybe it was technology that was developed and then they could expand it this is just a partial list for you scratch resistant lenses nasa actually gave a license to foster grant then for those sunglasses that don't scratch the insulin pump firefighting equipment the dust buster itself the dust buster <laughs> was invented by nasa think about that you had to have a little portable vacuum in those tight quarters right uh lasik the LASIK technology was developed through NASA. Shock absorbers for buildings, solar cells, uh, wireless headsets, the smoke detector, freeze-dried foods, CAT scans. Now, some of this stuff is actually very, very important, obviously. CAT scans, uh, baby formula, camera phones were developed through NASA technology, memory foam, workout machines, home insulation, 
ice-resistant airplanes. Yes, and yes, the portable computer. And, you know, you go back to that freeze-dried food thing. Let's never forget, now, when I was a kid, the space food stick was the coolest snack you could have, just yes. like the astronauts. I don't know what was in it. It always had peanut butter flavor or caramel flavor, but the space food stick, and, of course, Tang, which was fake orange juice. And Tang was not just powdered orange juice. It was the sponsor of the space program. When you were watching coverage of a liftoff, the news anchor desks that had the rockets in back of them had a Tang logo right on the front of the desk. You don't really get that in the news business anymore. Yeah, pretty amazing stuff. And I was reminded uh, re-watching the movie Road. There are two moments, indelible moments, when Walter Cronkite uh, took off his glasses and paused to gather his own emotions. One was on November 22nd, 1963, when he delivered the news to the nation that John F. Kennedy had been pronounced dead, that he was that he was gone. And he took off his glasses and the whole nation started to weep with him. And on the opposite end of the spectrum, it's the night the astronauts set foot on the moon, that Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon, and he took off his glasses again, Walter Cronkite, because he couldn't believe it, that, that this had actually happened, this great moment of triumph. Only, what, six years after the assassination of JFK, who famously said we were going to put a man on the moon before the end of the decade. Years later, CBS News did a retrospective of Walter Cronkite's career, and here's him describing what went through his head at that moment. Uh, I had, I'd had as long as NASA to prepare for that landing, and I'd thought of a lot of fine words that I could say appropriate for the momentous nature of this escape. Okay, we're going to be busy for a minute. I was speechless. I, I was speechless, and again, it's one of those events that uh, maybe I'd like to play it differently, but I'm not so sure I would. It was that kind of a moment, a speechless moment for all mankind. And we should remember this other crazy factoid. It was only six decades after Kitty Hawk, after the Wright brothers first took flight. A couple guys get a couple feet off the ground in what was essentially a converted bicycle, and 60 years later, we're landing on the moon. It's just remarkable. And, you know, we're here in Chicago, and I know one of the capsules you might know wrote is at the Museum of Science and Industry. Mm -hmm. uh, and you could go to various, obviously, museums in Washington, and you see you see the technology, which is incredible, but you also realize, you know, Chuck Yeager, Sam Shepard said it in the movie several times, spam in a can was the way he described it. You're like, they went up in that? Right. That looks like one of those little, you know, those little car rental things where they're little miniature toy cars that you can rent in the big cities? It looks like they went up in one of those. When you see them, whether it's at the Air and Space Museum in Washington or the Air Force Museum outside Dayton, Ohio, or mm. here, wherever they happen to be, you can see the generational difference. You, yeah. The Mercury capsules were the ones that you see in this limited series in the movie, The Right Stuff. That was a single man capsule. Right. They're about the size of your bathtub. The next iteration was Gemini. Those were two man capsules. And that's like two bathtubs, mm -hmm. like in a Viagra commercial or Cialis or whatever the hell the commercial is. <laughs> <laughs> then then you get to Apollo and these guys are going to go to the moon. It's like four bathtubs. Yeah. It's like a shower, essentially. It's like a nice shower. That's how big the stuff is. You can't believe how utilitarian things were, too. The movies actually make those control boards look fancier than they were in yeah. some cases. You know, there's just a couple of buttons and just a bunch of dials. Look like a 57 Chevy, you know, like <laughs> just changing the radio stations. And I think a lot of what we're talking about, Ro, is why... Space travel, whether you know, fictional movies, documentaries, or dramatizations of real-life events are so appealing to A-list actors. I've got another little list for you here. These are Academy Award-winning actors who have played space travelers in the last 10 years. Now, some of them haven't won their Oscar yet, but they are all Academy Award winners. You know, Sean Penn in the first. Now, that's about that's a series about going to Mars. Right. He's going to be the first there. Anne Hathaway and Matthew McConaughey were in Interstellar, which also features Matt Damon, who doesn't have an acting Oscar, but has a screenplay Oscar. George Clooney and Sandra Bullock were in Gravity. Hilary Swank is in a series called Away. That's another one about where they're leaving the moon and trying to get to Mars. Brad Pitt and Tommy Lee Jones were in Ad Astra. Natalie Portman played an astronaut in Lucy in the Sky. So there's something about space travel that just is inherently dramatic and irresistible to Hollywood. We're going to take a quick one-minute break, but on the other side, 
we're going to talk about one of the best space movies of the last 10 years, and it's a movie you probably haven't seen. Today, every business is digital, from SEO to e-commerce. AmericanEagle.com delivers innovative website design, development, and digital solutions, driving business growth for their clients. AmericanEagle.com's 20-year partnership with WeatherTech, the global leader in some of the most innovative products in the automotive protection industry, focuses on building and maintaining an e-commerce platform that converts their website traffic into sales revenue. With a focus on advanced functionality and navigation, ease in finding specific products, and engaging content. Their e-commerce platform provides a great user experience, accelerating WeatherTech's tremendous growth over the last two decades. A customized mobile app that works on any device provides the same satisfying e-commerce experience. AmericanEagle.com also hosts the website in their data center, providing safe, secure, and efficient support for billions of transactions for customers all over the globe. AmericanEagle.com provides website design and development and e-commerce solutions for all kinds of businesses in many different industries. When your business needs to think more digital, talk to AmericanEagle.com, building your digital mindset. Call AmericanEagle.com at 877-WEB-NOW-1 or visit AmericanEagle.com. We're talking about space movies and television shows. Disney Plus has The Right Stuff, which is a reboot, essentially, of the 1983 movie and the 1979 book by Tom Wolfe. Really good limited series. They're going to drop one episode a week, essentially, through the rest of the year. If you love Mad Men, if you love the space program, you want to combine the whole thing together, it's a very, very fun watch. You know, Ro, I was so inspired by the scenes of those astronauts in their convertible red Corvettes that I almost went out and got one, but then I realized I live in Chicago and we're approaching winter, so a 1962 red convertible Corvette is probably not a practical purchase. No, I, I don't think it's not I a good buy. Okay. No. All right, so we were talking about the allure of space films, not just to audiences, but also to Hollywood. Actors, directors, they all want to be in them because they seem to lead, whether directly or indirectly, to Oscars and big box office. People love the idea of getting off the planet Earth, and, and I, I sort of <laughs> now understand why. Now they're going why. to Mars, even Saturn in, in one of these shows now, I think. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Let's go over there! <laughs> so, going back to 2001 A Space Odyssey, mm -hmm. which was groundbreaking. That changed everything. Yes. Everybody was chasing that ethic. Following on with Star Wars and then all of the other great uh, real-life space stories that have been told, including this one. There's a little film that was made a couple of years ago by Damien Chazelle, starring Ryan Gosling as Neil Armstrong, first man. It did not do great at the box office, but it is a really special look, a quiet look at a very loud event. That's exactly right, Ro. Uh, first man, Ryan Gosling, is, is brilliant here, and it's really told almost strictly from his point of view. It's not the big sweeping picture look at NASA and Gemini and Mercury and Apollo. It's about the first man on the moon, an engineer, uh, named Neil Armstrong, who in some ways was the polar opposite of John Glenn in that he was not someone looking to be on the cover of Life magazine. He was not someone, although he was approached several times, that wanted to become a United States senator. He wanted to do the job. And a lot of this, again, uh, Claire Foy, who's a, a wonderful actress playing his wife. There's a lot of uh, scenes of their marriage together. Uh, they lost a daughter who was just two years old when she died. And there's a lot of, it's almost like this melancholy uh, look at things. And, of course, there was a lot of loss of life with the NASA program itself. You know, people you know risked their lives and there were some, some horrible accidents. So there was about that very human risk, even though they were reaching for the moon. Through all the initial programs, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, we never lost anybody in space. Mm -hmm. But we lost people here on Earth who were either training or traveling. NASA was always very proud of never having lost anybody in space. Yeah. And then the shuttle program, which had twin tragedy. Going back to something that we mentioned a little bit earlier, people who are in the military will understand this completely, that when you get inside military equipment, and essentially that's what these vehicles were, very Spartan, very utilitarian, things don't always work as they're supposed to work. And you see that assayed in some of these movies, obviously Apollo 13 being the most relevant story around that. And that's one of the things that I think is so special about First Man, because director Damien Chazelle told us back in 2018 how important it was to make that film look and feel exactly like it looked and felt through Neil Armstrong's eyes. 
so we we felt like if we could shoot it in a way where the audience always felt like they were right there physically, mm-hmm. they yeah. were there in the capsule, uh, and sometimes that means only seeing what the astronauts would see, yeah. not going outside. Um, that they were there in the household, that they were there with the kids and with the families. Um, that you know that you could hopefully come away feeling like you got to see what Neil saw. Um, and so you know, mm. down to like moments on the moon where we shoot a lot of it from Neil's POV. Yeah. That was sort of that was the angle Incredible. I wanted to take. Ro, you mentioned the utilitarian technology, and in Apollo 13, which is definitely in my top five, maybe my top three movies about astronauts ever made, there's this um, you know incredible sequence where we see things going wrong when they're you know Camp Commander James Lovell and the crew going to the moon, and we're told at one point that the thing that went wrong with the oxygen tanks was a malfunction that had been really committed two years before Lovell was even named the commander of that particular craft i mean you know that much in the making but the crux of this movie and it's like a, it's like a great thriller thanks to the direction of ron howard and the production design and, and the and the wonderful cast it's all about the most successful failure in the history of the program scanning channels and apollo 13 comes on you drop the remote you watch it from whatever it is even if it's the closing credits mm-hmm. i watch it all yeah. the way through yeah, that's so true. Kathleen Quinlan, who played Marilyn Lovell, Jim Lovell's wife, got a supporting actress nomination. So we do get those classic at-home scenes with the wives and the kids watching this on play on television role. But what Apollo 13 also reminded us was that by the time that mission was going up, Americans were kind of, okay, we know we can do that. They weren't broadcasting all of it live like they were with the previous missions. It wasn't an afterthought, but it wasn't the groundbreaking event that the first man on the moon had been. And then, of course, it became a live television event when everything went wrong, and it looked like it was a long shot that we are going to be able to get these three men home. From the beginning of the space program, were more people watching Neil Armstrong step on the moon than had watched any other television show prior to that. Even now, when we send people up to the space station, as we do very regularly, or at the end of the shuttle program, when we were putting shuttles up once a month, once every other month, the American public specifically has lost interest in it. Well, that is a point that is made also in the Netflix documentary series about Challenger, Challenger Final Flight, that we had gotten so used to these incredible space shuttle uh, launchings that they weren't even covering it on on the live news. And we're starting to get the beginning of cable news at the time. And that's one of the reasons why there was a decision made to get public interest going, to make this a great human interest story again. Let's put a teacher in space. Let's have a civilian join the crew and the series gets into a lot of that of course Kristen McAuliffe and that's what made that such an event and and with Apollo 13 it was because it looked like they weren't going to be able to to, to come home and you know that's the famous Houston we've got a problem and Tom Hanks uh, the late Bill Paxton and Kevin Bacon are so good because you talk about the claustrophobia and what you mentioned before three guys in a bathtub essentially they're here they are on top of each other dealing with a myriad of problems. It starts with one thing, but then it goes on to many, many other things. While Gary Sinise, as Ken Mattingly, who wasn't able to go on the flight because they thought he might have the measles, he's home with hundreds of staffers at NASA trying to figure out a way to kind of put something together, MacGyver style, right, to get the craft home. And then coming full circle, Ed Harris, who played John Glenn in The Right Stuff, is now Mission Control. I want you guys to find every engineer who designed every switch, every circuit, every transistor, and every light bulb that's up there. Then I want you to talk to the guy in the assembly line who actually built the thing. Find out how to squeeze every amp out of both of these goddamn machines. I want this marked all the way back to Earth with time to spare. We never lost an American in space. We're sure as hell not going to lose one on my watch. Failure is not an option. One other thing about Apollo 13, one of the last movies to use practical effects Mm -hmm. of weightlessness. Now it's all done with CG or in some other form, there's a way to do it. In many of those movies, and specifically in Apollo 13, they would actually get on board an airplane. They actually would build a set on the inside of a retired 727 passenger jet. The jet would go up to altitude and then do this parabolic turn, during which the people on board are experiencing positive Gs. It makes them float for 20 or 30 seconds at a time while they're doing it, where you see the astronauts actually floating or or shooting through a passageway. And when you stop and think about the amount of stress that that puts on guys who are trained to be astronauts, let alone actors. 
Well, can you imagine if you're like, you know, shooting a scene that's going to be about a minute and a half and you're like two lines away and then ba- Kevin Bacon flubs his line <laughs> and Hank's just like, are you kidding me? <laughs> Come on, man. Get it together. <laughs> I think you'll notice, by the way, when you watch the films, they're not talking when they're moving. That's a very interesting point. You know, we talked about uh, you know these these great, almost mythic American figures, and unfortunately, you know, of course, now many of them have left us. But Commander Jim Lovell, first of all, Tom Hanks perfectly cast, even though it doesn't really physically resemble him, but he's you know Hanks has all of the qualities to play someone like. Uh, Commander Jim Lovell, and you and I have had the pleasure and the honor of speaking to him on a number of occasions. And it's he's this living legend, and he's accomplished so much, but he's also like you're just talking to your grandfather, the yep. kindest, warmest man you can just possibly imagine. Right, and just imagine what he went through. Uh, you just can't, you just cannot imagine it. The other thing about astronauts that should be pointed out is, despite how they are portrayed in all of these movies especially in the Netflix series where these guys are strapping 6'2", 6'3", whatever they are. Those guys were all short. They had to be short. Mm. They all had to be under 5'10", because they couldn't fit in the equipment, as we were talking about. When I watch it, it's almost a comic to see, especially in the limited series, The Right Stuff, there's a guy who looks like Stork from Animal House, and you're like, no, no, wait a second. That guy can't fit in that capsule. Well, and there's what we, we like to call your poetic license, where when you're going to play larger-than-life characters, sometimes they're going to be a lot larger than the real-life characters. On that note, we'll leave it there. This is Rowan Roper, the podcast, powered by AmericanEagleStudios.com. Please remember to tell all your friends about the podcast and subscribe wherever you find your podcasts. On behalf of Richard Roper, I'm Ro Khan. See you next time.